I'm Pam Munoz Ryan and speaking to you from North San Diego County in California from my home office. My newest novel is Manana Land, the cover art by Paola Escobar. The story is about a boy named Maximiliano Cordoba who lives somewhere in the Americas long after once upon a time, yet many years before happily ever after. He's 12 years old and loves football or as we call it soccer. In fact, he wants to be a professional player, just like his father and his grandfather before him. He also comes from a long line of stonemasons who build bridges. And he grows up knowing a legend that has been handed down by generations of bridge builders about a mythical gatekeeper who can guide brave travelers on a journey to find tomorrow. If Max could see tomorrow, maybe then he would know if he would make the celebrated Santa Maria football team or whether he'd ever meet his mother who disappeared when he was a baby. But any information about her is shrouded in secrecy. His father won't talk, his grandfather won't talk, no one in his village will talk. Through a series of mysterious events, Max discovers a long hidden family secret, which makes him question where he fits into the world and his life begins to unravel. So he sets out to find answers with a treasured compass, a mysterious stone rubbing and the legend of the gatekeeper as his only guides. The ideas for my books are usually a confluence of rivers, many inklings that come together to form the final premise. Some years ago, I wrote a short story entitled First Crossing about a young boy who crossed the US border for the first time with his father in order to work in the fields in California. In that story, the characters are ushered by a coyote, a person who brings immigrants for huge amounts of money who exploits them and sometimes puts them in incredibly dangerous situations and threatens their lives. I had always wanted to show the reverse story about guardians, people who help people without gain and for altruistic reasons. So that had been in the back of my mind for a while. Then when I was in New York next, I was able to meet up with my editor, Tracy Mack, and Peter Seitz, who illustrated my book, The Dreamer. He had a portfolio with him with many sketches of stone arch bridges in, from Prague, where he is from. The bridges were ancient and intriguing and mysterious. And I love the metaphorical quality of the bridges too, the symbolism of connecting one side of the river to the other. Initially, I imagined a boy walking near a bridge on the bank of the river with his father. And I saw this boy with a wild imagination who asked his father unanswerable questions like, how can I catch the moon? And how can I reach the horizon? And how can I hold tomorrow in the palm of my hand? I didn't know why the boy wanted to hold tomorrow. I didn't know the adventures that would ensue, but I did know from that very first visualization that the father and son would have some sort of conflict or frustration between them and ultimately a reunion. So one leap of the imagination led to another. I wanted this story to be far reaching and parable like so that it would reflect the age old legacy of people needing protection and those who rise up to protect them, people helping people and the never ending story about those in hiding and their guardians. I purposely set the story in an obscure place that could be any number of countries, villages or even in our very own backyards. And with equal intention, I did not set the story in a particular year. As it happened centuries ago, it's happening now all over the world, and it's likely to continue in the tomorrows to come. At its core, I wanted Manana Land to be about adults modeling kindness and courage and nurturing in their children a legacy of compassion. And I hoped that the reader would realize that Manana Land is not only a place, but a state of mind. American ingenuity, especially in our trying times today, um, really makes me think deeply about how we rise up during times of crisis and how when our regular lives are disheveled and everything that we have known to be um, familiar fades away, how, um, how brave and courageous people are and how they, are, how they grapple with that change. Um, what impresses me is how, what impresses me are the creative solutions that people come up with. Um, and as far as the ingenuity, when I look at my own ability to create stories, I often question what gave me the ability to create stories or what gave me the ability 
to um, take things beyond, you know, the box. And one of the things that I think helped me the most was that I was blessed with an unchoreographed childhood and that I was, I grew up comfortable with my own wandering thoughts. And, and I think that's what happens very often when we are going through a time in our country where we have a lot of time with ourselves. And sometimes that enables us to reach very deep and do things differently from the way we did things before. Yeah, because the adage, well, we've always done it this way, doesn't work anymore. So I'm always impressed and inspired by people who take that step forward and say, okay, let's try something different. And those people inspire me. I wish the Library of Congress was closer to me so that I could use it on a regular basis. Um, I have been there and for various National Book Festival events and for tours. And I have received um, several um, awards in, in the Library of Congress, which have been lovely and they've given me, they've graciously given me tours. It's so impressive and really so awe-inspiring. You stand in the festival and some of the foyers and you just, it, it just takes your breath away. And um, I wish um, it was closer. I'm in California and, and it's on the other coast, so it's not that close for me. For me, a library saved me. I, um, I grew up during a time when I didn't have a library in my elementary school. I didn't have a library in my classroom. I moved across town the summer before fifth grade and I was the new kid. I was um, the new kid in the neighborhood, the new kid at school, and I discovered a very tiny, small branch library not far from my house. And it became my refuge. And I just became what you would consider an obsessive reader. And from the time I was like fifth grade through ninth grade, um, books saved me. They took me away from everything in my life that was difficult. And I find it interesting that now I write for the same age that I was when books made the biggest difference in my life. Well, for students that that are aspiring writers, I would say to you to keep your writing, save it. I wish I had done that. I didn't save my diaries or my journals or any of those things from when I was a child and I miss them. So even if you don't think they're any good, um, I would tell you to just put them away somewhere because someday they're gonna be very precious to you. Um, I would also want to say to you that I never get things right the first time. And I've been asked before, what do you wish students asked you that they never ask you? And I would say, I wish they asked me about failure because any successes in publishing or writing that you see are the very tip of a very big iceberg. And at the bottom of that iceberg are many, many start overs and failures and um, times where I have to regroup, I have to rewrite. And I like to say to people, I'm, I'm not a writer, I'm a rewriter. Because even from that very first sentence that I write, I'm always going back to the beginning. Something to, because the manuscript becomes something to fix, something to change, something to make better always. So I would say, don't be so critical with your writing, save it and just keep revisiting it to make it better. Before I say goodbye, I'd like to tell you all about something that's special to me. This September, is the 20th anniversary of the publication of Esperanza Rising. It will have been in print for 20 years. I'd like to thank all of the teachers who have introduced the book to children, all the librarians who have put the books into students' hands, and all of the readers who over the years have wrote me very poignant and touching letters. Thank you for tuning in today. Thank you to the National Book Festival and the Library of Congress, to my editor, Tracy Mack, and especially to my publisher, Scholastic. Happy reading.